Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here with me. My name is Tina Hurley. I'm the founder and CEO of Less Leg, More Heart, a 501c3 charity that helps amputees with support supplies and services to improve their quality of life. If you want more information about our organization, please visit our website at lesslegmoreheart.com. All of our social stuff is linkable from there, including our YouTube, where we upload content from these Heart to Heart Peer Mentor sessions that run the second Thursday of every month, same place, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern. And this is really a forum, uh, a platform that we bring health and wellness experts that are vetted to the comfort of your homes um, in order to improve your quality of life to give you perspective or thoughts or tools or resources that maybe you otherwise didn't know much about, or maybe you knew a little bit about it and you have more questions, that person's right there for you to be able to ask live Q&A to and have as a resource thereafter. So we are uh, joined by kind of now vet uh, for our program and, and now a, a dear friend of mine. Um, we're really lucky. Uh, we have April Adams here again today. She came on again last year and man, I just learned so much from her when she educates. She's the international director of Orpheus Academy, which she'll share more about. She's a best-selling author and a specialist in relationship issues, overwhelm, resentment, um, longing, negative childhood experiences, limiting beliefs, fears, phobias, and also recently a new budding artist. So without further ado, <laughs> April, thank you so much for coming back today. Thank you, Tina. I, I really appreciate the introduction and uh, the mention of the art. I just started doing art and it seems to be doing very well. So it's it's super exciting. But I am so pleased to see you all here. Thank you so much for making the time to come and be here with us for this. Uh, so once again, I'm April Adams and I am an emotional health consultant. And what that means is I teach tools and techniques that you can use to easily move past any unwanted emotional reactivity. And so I also do work as the lead trainer for the app that hosts the tools that I use, which are a series of audio tracks. And I'll get more into the information on all of that shortly. But first, I just want to reassure you that you're here for the right reasons. And so basically, this is for you if you've suffered a traumatic event and continue to have any kind of triggers arise whenever something reminds you of it, uh, if you've had a pattern of being mistreated throughout your life in any way, uh, or if you have a fear or phobia that you'd like to overcome. And most of all, this is for you if you've tried a million things like talk therapy, mindfulness, meditation, so on and so forth, and haven't really gotten the desired emotional relief that you've wanted from all of that. And I completely feel you on that because, you know, I had my own stuff. I, you know, while I haven't had a major significant trauma that stands out to me, uh, I really had a very negative outlook on life and I had kind of a pretty negative upbringing. So I was just in an ugly place in my head. And so I was very controlling in my relationships and had a horrible mindset and, I remember just trying everything I possibly could to alleviate my own suffering and to fix my relationships and to get my head straight. And I still kept having to work on the same issues over and over and over again. And it just got to the point where I was like, how many layers are there to this thing? How, <laughs> how much time and energy do I have to spend to overcome these issues? So I know how frustrating it can be to be doing the work and trying as hard as you can and still not feeling the relief and still not really being in the headspace consistently where you want to be. And the reason that all of that stuff really hasn't worked for us is because it doesn't address the emotions where they arise in the first place, which is in the subconscious mind. So, we can go around consciously talking sense to ourselves all day, using logic, talking ourselves down, saying, oh, I shouldn't be reacting to that. I'm safe right now. But that's all on the conscious level. We're just consciously talking to ourselves. And yet the place that the reaction is coming from, that the trauma response, that the trigger, that the fear-based reaction is coming from is deeper 
within the subconscious mind. And unless we actually address the issue on the subconscious level and convince the subconscious that we're safe, we're going to continue having reactions to something no matter how many times we talk ourselves down from it. And so that's why no matter how hard you've worked, <laughs> it still tends to come up. So this is kind of like the final puzzle piece. If you can figure out how to get into the subconscious mind and create that change, you're actually able to finally get the results you've been trying to get all this time. So I want to break this down a little bit more simply here. So, you know, just to give you an idea of what the subconscious mind is, I want to talk about what the conscious mind is, the subconscious and the unconscious. So first of all, the conscious mind that's our logical planning brain. That's where we would, you know, plan something out, schedule something, have a conversation. We're primarily using our conscious minds here today. And a lot of learning is done through the conscious mind as well. But to really keep things long term, the subconscious mind kicks in. So it's like the subconscious is constantly just recording everything that happens to us. And it's always running in the background, scanning for threats. And so if an emotional reaction comes up, 99 out of 100 times, that's coming from the subconscious mind. And it's basically looking for what could harm us, what could go wrong, what's lacking, <laughs> you know, like it's looking for what needs to be fixed or avoided and then giving us a reaction, a fight or flight response or something along those lines in order to get our attention and have us act as a way to avoid or prevent something that it thinks is a threat. The unconscious mind is much more around dealing with our autonomic body systems. So it works our digestion, our heartbeat, our respiratory system, all of those kinds of things in the background that we really are completely unconscious of for the most part. So why we tend to react or overreact emotionally sometimes, you know, I mean, of course, if we actually experience a trauma and in the moments during and after it, we're reacting, that completely makes sense. I mean, we absolutely should be reacting in those times. That can really save our lives to have that knee-jerk reaction. However, once we've experienced something that the subconscious mind considers traumatic, anytime anything remotely similar pops up, we may be triggered all over again. So anything that could remote less, remotely remind us of that negative thing, suddenly all these bells and whistles are going off, we may not even be consciously aware of why. So here's an example of something that really doesn't seem to make much sense, but um, it's, it's really incredible how often this kind of thing happens. So let's say you witness a uh, convenience store getting robbed and you're standing at the end of an aisle and you're seeing the robbery occur and you're feeling the, you know, the fight or flight response to it as you're watching it happen. And you ha there's like a big orange bottle out of the side of your eye over here and there's a certain smell in the, the environment. And so your subconscious is recording everything, every detail of what's going on in this moment. Consciously, you're only going, oh, holy crap, it's get it, we're getting robbed. Am I going to die? Am I going to get shot? What's going to happen? But subconsciously, every single detail is getting downloaded and recorded. So then five years later, you could be in a Walmart at the end of an aisle and there's an orange container up here out of the side of your eye and it smells similar. And suddenly you're having a panic attack. And going, what? I'm just here to buy some ditch detergent. Why am I having a panic attack right now? And that's the kind of stuff the subconscious mind does. It creates reactivity even at times where we logically consciously don't fully believe that there's a threat. So we need to get the subconscious mind to snap out of it and to understand that the things that are not the trauma that you've been through in the past are not current threats to you in this moment so that you can move on from it and let it go and not have random panic attacks sneak up on you out of the blue. Now, similarly, one of my colleagues treated a woman who had uh, generalized anxiety disorder. 
And she had no idea why. She was in her mid-30s. And she had had generalized anxiety since she was a teenager, and it had just randomly started when she was a teenager. So the colleague of mine that was working with her helped her to trace it back to watching a movie in which there was a nuclear explosion. And they realized that essentially she saw this nuclear explosion in this movie. Her subconscious mind had decided, oh my gosh this could happen, something really horrible could happen, I need to be on guard, I need to constantly be watching for what's going to get me, what's going to blow up in my life. And so they were able to do the work on her subconscious mind to, you know, and this, I'm talking like 20 minutes of work, <laughs> and it completely cleared her generalized anxiety. She did not have to walk around any longer with this generalized anxiety and that reactivity that was constantly there and running in the background. So there are different types of trauma responses. So first of all, there's the common thing of PTSD. Now PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, tends to come from an isolated traumatic event. So anything that creates an extreme trauma. And there's also something called CPTSD, which is complex PTSD. That tends to come from a collection of events. So something that tends to happen to you over and over and over again. So it doesn't tend to seem like it would be trauma if it just happens once or twice. But the fact that it happens over and over and over and over again in your life it begins to build into a trauma. So even something as simple as people dismissing your feelings and telling you you're too sensitive, you shouldn't be reacting the way you are, blah, blah, blah. That kind of thing can be a trauma. It can create a complex trauma response in which any time someone even remotely seems to be dismissing your feelings, you're super reactive to it. So it doesn't really matter whether you've got PTSD from an isolated event or complex PTSD from something that tended to happen over and over and over again, it all creates a trauma response in which we are reactive even when we don't want to be, even when logically we're like, why am I being so reactive? And sometimes we can be super reactive to something when we just know this is ridiculous why am i reacting like this it's just a comment on social media it's just a you know offhand comment my mother-in-law made why am i freaking out about this so badly and it really has a lot to do with the fact that our ancestors used to have a lot more threats in their lives than we do um, you know, while, yes, we can have some difficult things occur in our lives, we don't have the same level of threat to our lives day in and day out that our ancestors tended to have. And it helped our ancestors survive if they were constantly hypervigilant, watching for that tiger to chase them, or, you know, trying to figure out how to get their next meal. And so we now have that same programming in us but our lives are kind of laid out fairly easily for us. And so we will react to a comment on social media (laughs) that doesn't mean much as though there is suddenly a tiger chasing us. And so once again, it takes getting the subconscious to calm the heck down about things and to be able to react in a way that is actually in alignment with the situation and to allow the subconscious to stop being so incredibly reactive. So if we look at complex PTSD, a lot of those kinds of triggers actually begin in the zero to seven year range. So typical PTSD comes from, you know, okay, a car accident or battle or something along those lines where there is a massive one-time trauma. But with the complex PTSD, it is often based in childhood and can sometimes even go all the way back to being left to cry it out as a baby or not feeling like you get enough attention from your parents or having your feelings dismissed all the time. So, you know, those kinds of things, often when we are looking for where did this originate so that we can really take care of it and clear it up on the subconscious level, a lot of those things do start out 
in zero to seven years old. So we won't even always have a memory of those things occurring. But a lot of times you can logically assume if I was treated a certain way when I was seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, my parents probably treated me similarly when I was zero to seven. And that's not about blaming anybody. It's not saying you have bad parents or anything like that. It's more about how did you feel when that thing was happening or not happening when you were young? And was that ever processed in a healthy way for you? So it's not about, oh, my bad parents did this to me or they never did this for me. It's about processing how you felt as a child and being able to kind of convince that aspect of yourself that you're safe and you're okay, even when those needs aren't constantly being met for you or if something feels similar to something negative that you experienced before. So if you were to think about something recent that's been bothering you, you know, something that came up within the last week and you've just been like it, replaying it, replaying the conversation in your head or imagining having a conversation where you're arguing with a person or, you know, anything like that, you can start to kind of think about the thoughts and feelings that you have when that kind of thing is happening and what you've been thinking about it, you know, since it happened. And the questions you want to then ask yourself is what's really bothering me about this? You know, is it that they disrespected you? Is it that they dismissed your feelings? Is it that it makes you feel criticized? You know, so just looking at what is bothering you most about that thing and then asking yourself, when have I experienced that before? When was the earliest time in my life that I probably experienced that kind of thing? And so that's how you find the root of where something began so that you can then address it at its origin point uh, or in the origin of the series of that kind of thing happening. Of course, with typical PTSD, it's much easier to find the root because you know exactly what the situation was that led to that trauma response. So once I found out <laughs> that it really takes subconscious work to be able to address these things and to be able to move on from them, I started trying everything I could get my hands on. So I tried EMDR, which is a very popular trauma recovery uh, treatment, where in, typically what that is is moving your eyes in a certain way to activate both sides of your brain. So you're in a whole brain state while you replay a traumatic event or something like that. Um, and eventually it helps you to reprocess that particular trauma so you no longer have a fight or flight response to it. But what I find with EMDR is that it often takes several sessions, is maybe six to 10 sessions for many people before they get that relief. So every time you're going to a therapist, you're sitting there, you're thinking about that negative thing for an extended period of time while you're moving your eyes, and then you're left to your own devices in between sessions and you still have to cope with those emotions and those thoughts and feelings are still coming up and there's no resolution <laughs> until finally you do it often enough until it goes. Similarly with hypnosis, we can address with hypnosis specific symptoms, specific behaviors, things like that, but it doesn't often take care of the issue at its root. And so, okay, great, I can address certain behavior patterns, but if you're not addressing why you're doing that behavior in the first place and where that originated, it's probably gonna come back or you're going to do some other behavior instead whenever that kind of trigger arises for you. Um, I tried NLP, which is like doing different visualization techniques and things like that, did some inner child work. I did the EFT tapping. Um, and I found that with a lot of those things, if you kept at it over an extended period of time, eventually it would work. But a lot of times this stuff is like way deep in your subconscious mind. And so you do a round of maybe EFT or EMDR or something on it. And now it's a layer closer. And so the next time you're triggered by something like that, it's even more intense. And then you do some work on it and now it's a layer closer. And <laughs> then the next time you're even more intensely triggered and it just keeps going like that. But if you keep at doing work on it, eventually it will make its way out and you'll be able to move on from it. So I was still frustrated with that 
need to continuously work on the same topic over and over and over again before it would finally resolve. So that's where I finally found the tools that I've been working with recently, which are available on an app called Orpheus Mind Technologies. And so what Orpheus has is an audio track that's about 12 minutes long, where it combines all of the most effective aspects of every proven scientific treatment for the subconscious mind into one set of tools. <laughs> so it takes the best elements of hypnosis, the best elements of EMDR, the best elements of NLP, and the guy who created it used to be a computer programmer. And he recognized a lot of similarities in the way that our brains and a computer process language patterns and information. So he really created something where like the timing is made just right for the brain to take it in. The language is just right for the brain to take it in. You've got bilateral stimulation, like with EMDR, you've got suggestion to the brain as to what to do with those thoughts and feelings after the fact. So it just hits it from every possible angle. And what it does is convinces the subconscious mind that you're safe in the face of a perceived threat. So the suggestion throughout the track is basically convincing your subconscious that you're safe. Um, and then it also, so when we have a traumatic response to something, there's synaptic connections in the brain that connect a trigger to our response to it. So there's all these little connectors in the brain that create those, those connections. So that anytime that trigger comes up, that emotional response immediately automatically comes up on autopilot. And what this track does is starts to disconnect those two things because throughout the track, you're thinking about the difficult thing that happened and automatically the emotional response is going to come up. And so those parts of your brain are getting lit up and basically it's being unplugged from danger, plugged into safety so that the next time you experience anything that reminds you of that, or that would typically trigger that you have a neutral emotional response to it instead. So essentially, you just play this audio track while you think about the negative thing or the series of negative things throughout your life. You have a bit about it. You get as worked up about it as you can. And there are these three sounds that are played throughout that you have to tap your hands to that kind of create that bilateral stimulation thing. And it's really ridiculous. Tina can attest to <laughs> powerful these tools are and so can I. Uh, so what's really cool about this is that typically when you would go for hypnosis, EMDR, you know, anything like that, you would normally only be able to work on maybe your top five issues ever because it's such a lengthy drawn out process. But if you're able to work on something within 10 to 20 minutes and resolve it, it makes it so you can work on anything that bothers you, literally anything that bothers you. So it can be used on the hugest trauma, the biggest phobias, anything like that. And it can equally be used on the tiniest, stupidest, most insignificant things like a comment on social media or your frustration with your kids or <laughs> your frustration with yourself, <laughs> anything along those lines as well. So uh, basically, what I've been doing since I started working with these, I work with clients directly to show them how to get the best possible results in order to get lasting, fast clearance with these tools um, to make sure that they're able to completely obliterate it and not have to keep coping with it or not have to keep coming back and working on the same topic over and over and over again. And I've also helped Orpheus to develop their training program that trains self-helpers, therapists, and coaches in how to get the best possible results either for themselves or their clients as well. So I am um, the person that you want to come to with any questions about these tools and how to use them and, and all of that. So I will share a link in the comments about, you know, how to, how to get in touch with me, how to find these tools so that you can access the Orpheus app yourself. Um, and now I'd like to open the floor to any questions or comments that anyone has at this time. Well, I will just jump in and start. Um... April, thank you. Every single time 
you talk about stuff like I digest another piece, but now having experienced uh, April and this global company um, came out to actually run a seminar for Less Leg More Heart and um, they exposed us to the science of, you know, the brain and these, you know, visceral reactions versus the the sort of top end um, reactions and just uh, really lessened my ignorance about some of the things that have happened to me that have happened to other people around me, you know, coming from a, a veteran family, um, most of them have traumas related to their service. I have a diagnosis of a complex PTSD from many things growing up. And then of course, all the things in my leg that's more publicized, but the, the why you behave certain ways or the linking, as you had mentioned, of responses to different stimuluses was an interesting concept. And so then we actually got to participate in the audio tracks. And when I first heard you speak, April, and this was last year at a wellness clinic or a wellness seminar, and I'm like, I want to learn more because it sounds, A, a little gimmicky because it's too simple sounding or quick sounding to be effective. <laughs> right. and, and it's probably a million dollars. Like they're trying to sell something, you know? And uh, it's not. <laughs> it's um, There's a ton of science to it. And when I was listening to these audio tracks, which were like 12 minutes long, and it was like, you know, start with a reasonable small trauma. And I'm like, I'm going to give it a bigger one and I'm going to see what happens. And I thought about my divorce, like my husband leaving me, the feeling when I walked into my home and everything was gone and like the depth of abandonment that I had faced. And within, you know, time is kind of relative when you're in the middle of the track, but I will tell you that like the profound sorrow that I still feel when I think of that moment was and continues to be like significantly less. And I can't explain that much. I'm, you know, you can April, but I experienced the tracks. I was a skeptic going in and, um, and I was really baffled by that. And, and everybody that was in that room, all of the less like more heart people rated significant improvements in the distress that they were feeling related to the thing they were thinking of before the tracks and after. And it wasn't like people trying to pacify, like we really wanted to give critical and honest feedback. Um, and so that, I mean, we've had since uh, a couple of people that were at that seminar related to us that have like hired April and the company to help work through familial, you know, issues and generational problems. Like it's just, um, she's such a wealth of knowledge and she's really humble. But um, if you guys personally or know of anybody else, whether you're here in this group today or you're seeing this afterwards on our social channels or our YouTube, send a message and learn a little bit more because if you, you know, if you can break away, you know, 12 minutes to sit in a line for coffee at the local shop or scroll through your phone, you know, you can really invest that 12 minutes in yourself and start chipping away at some of the things that you're experiencing. And there's an endless amount of work to do. Uh, but the, the, the concept that you don't have to just palliate what you're feeling and learn how to manage what you're feeling and you can actually excavate it, um, that for me was a brand new concept when I learned about that. I thought I just had to learn how to cope with, and I got good at breath work and meditation and yoga. And I love those things. And I think they're incredible tools, but they don't take away the problem, the trigger, the thing where you smell the thing that reminds you of the, or you hear, or you, you visualize the, you know, the, the example you gave of the store. I mean, wow. Like it's hard for me to go into doctor's offices which is tough because I'm a physician assistant. Yeah. Like that's where I need to practice medicine because the triggers that are in there are so much related to my trauma. And um, I will utilize your platform as I start to get back to work and have to really like manage some of those specifics. So I wanted to give yeah. my personal testimony. Um, and I also, um, before we open up, cause I know Jill's got some things to say too. I want to give um, as a quick segue, uh, two quick shout outs, April, and I want, I'm excited that you get to hear about this. So uh, today our organization has been doing a ton of media and we um, met up with some incredible people, one of which was a company called Liquid Limbs that provides mobility items to people that have lower extremity um, disability, injury, or specifically below the knee amputees. So I have uh, James and Amora who are the co um creators of Liquid Limbs with us. And I wanted to give them just a very brief opportunity to explain their product and to drop the link for anybody that might be interested in it. Hey, Tima, thank you so much for having us here. Um, this is amazing. Obviously, we saw you today in April. Um, I was really fascinated by your talk on um, self-healing and, and this method. I was super interested 
um, just for myself, very interested. Um, and and uh, it's something we're we're trying to do is is to um, provide uh, devices. Actually, me and Amway here are engineers. Um, we make um, waterproof prosthetic devices for people with uh, amputations to help them stand in the shower and help them have an easier time navigating their home. And uh, and so we got to meet Tina and her team today. And uh, Sam here um, is with us. And and uh, it's been a really amazing experience uh, just to just just get to meet these people and, and kind of share these aligned missions to to help people and uh, help people to live more independent lives and, and more have more confidence in their lives. So um, really, really amazing to hear um, what you're doing. And uh, we actually have our first product is for people with below knee amputations to help them stand in the shower. It's called the Navigator. And, and so that's kind of uh, part of why we're here with Tina. Um, so we, we just want to get it to as many people as possible that can benefit from it. Um, so so and uh, she mentioned she had a Zoom, a Zoom call um, talking about this subject today. So I was really I'm happy to hop on and just share that with you guys. So um, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat to our website and and I just um, wanted to say hi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, um, yeah, you want to describe how it works? I don't yeah, have to be here. That's what you're going to do. Um, 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 but but yeah, basically it's uh, a stand a standing mobility aid. So it helps you to stand up in the shower and and allows you to make small steps uh, to and from the bathroom. Um, to the shower, it's it uh, doesn't cover your residual limb, so you can wash your limb in the shower. Um, and we've designed it like with the amputee community entirely, so you can you can take the device apart and you can put it into a small bag, take it with you if you go on a trip, um, and uh, and just kind of give you back that independence and that that confidence is is really our goal with the device. So um, Thanks, that, that's that's us, Liquid Limbs. I'll, I'll put it in the chat and. Uh, and I'm sure Sam wants to introduce himself too. Well, I, I want to do an intro for Sam, and this is the last segue, and then we're going to have a lot of really great Q&A for April. Sam is an Air Force veteran. He had an injury on um, while he was training um, special ops, and he um, had a terrible nine-year journey. And um, stay tuned to our social channels for um, a really wonderful interview that will give you guys details. But today, Sam uh, was gifted a Levitate running blade uh, the first running blade he's had in 12 years since his injury. And today he was able to run due to the generous fundraising of our organization through Anthony Capoletti. Uh, he was able to run today for the very first time in 12 years. This is a picture in the chat of him first opening his blade. We totally surprised him. And so mm -hmm. Sam, thanks for being here. You are an incredible amputee and really into the wellness journey. April, he would uh, at some point be a great connection. He's growing his platform. He's very much into mindset and breathing technique. And um, I'm excited to make that connection, but thanks for being here, Sam. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Congratulations. Well, yeah, right? Thank you. So happy for you. Jill, I yeah, want to go to you because you also experienced some of the seminars. Mm. So, uh, tell folks what you, what you went through there, what you experienced. <clears throat> well, like you, you know, you weren't sure what it was going to be like. And, but when we were there, I was kind of in awe learning all this stuff and I I played with it. I did it guilty of not continuing. I should have. Um, one of the things and I'm not sure the rest of us feel, but when we talk about traumas that go way, way back, when we're dealing with our immediate trauma, which all of us I'm sure have lost a limb, have gone through it. How do you, see, I think personally for myself, I almost want to fix that. I know you got to fix everything behind you. Like my, my March was a tough month. For some reason, I'd like I'd start crying, and but that was when I lost my leg, and I don't remember anything that happened around it. It's almost like this; it's missing. Um, and trying to be able to, when this time of the year comes, I really hate to have that same feeling every March, you know, because it takes over you and you can't control it. I don't know if any yeah. of you guys feel the same way, but when you have that emotion. You're saying, well, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? How come I'm sad? What, you know, and I look at myself and go, you should be happy. You're walking, you can drive your car. You can do all these wonderful things. I know April's going to have some things to say because she heard the should, the should word, but. <laughs> yeah, should, right. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? Um, that's, that's my thing. Cause I, I personally, my personality is to, I want to work on what I know is my issue. And yes, there's a lot of crap in the back, but I'm I'm just talking well, about that's those aren't your top priority right, right now. Right. Your top priority is the major trauma and the 
right. the current reactivity that's coming up around it. And typically mm -hmm. when I see people start to clear that, then they go, oh, what else can I clear? Yeah. So, you know, those, those things from your history that aren't like major trauma to you, those are, you know, small peanuts right now. And so those wouldn't be your primary focus. So it totally makes sense. And it's very common for the anniversary of something to bring up a ton of emotion. And that can actually be a great thing to tap into mm -hmm. when you're doing the subconscious work on it is to bring up those feelings that are naturally coming up mm -hmm. and acknowledge you know, what you went through, even if you don't have clear memory yeah. of those things, it can totally just like tell yourself the story, you know, talk about how you're feeling, talk to yourself and, you know, about what it is that occurred. And I mean, you can even acknowledge, like, I don't even have memory of it because it was so hard. Like I'm not allowing myself to remember it. And that's like, that's enough a lot of times to acknowledge while you're doing the work. So, you know, if you can't, for whatever reason, like fully immerse yourself in that particular memory. And sometimes it's because you have blocked out the memory of it. And sometimes it's because it's too intense. Um, you can just acknowledge anything associated with it. Sometimes it's just acknowledging the room it happened in or a person associated with it or just some aspect of it. But mm -hmm. the primary thing is the feeling that's coming up about it and how similar that is to the feeling that was happening around the time of the actual occurrence mm -hmm. and anything that you can April, acknowledge for, about it. For me too, April, when you were explaining it, it was, it was the tie of what it felt like. It wasn't necessarily <clears throat> the thing that was happening, right? It was the unifying feeling or theme, especially since you were young, that validated that lack of worth or love or acceptance. And some of those pieces take like concerted energy and time to actually like identify. And I feel like prior to this trauma with my leg being amputated and all the things, the thing that I had not done was like sit with myself, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Cause I've been with me the whole way, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I never took time probably intentionally as a coping stress or strategy from my trauma to, to sit with it, to think about it, to, to write down some patterns. Well, why did this bother me? Well, it made me feel, you know, like an outlier. Like I didn't have a place, like I wasn't feeling heard, like I was um, insignificant or unlovable or disfigured or whatever the thing is, the narrative. And I think until people understand the value in uh, kind of sitting in the discomfort of that vulnerability with themselves, that they really can't do the work. You know, that was the reason that I hadn't meditated in the very beginning for so long was because I was terrified to sit with myself for a few minutes. And well, I mean, it can be really re-traumatizing to try to meditate when you have unresolved trauma, because the first thing that your mind wants to do when you're quiet, I mean, think about when you lay down to sleep at night, if you've got unresolved trauma, like that's when it starts going. So you know, you sit down to meditate and you get into that nice, open, relaxed state and suddenly your brain is like, hey, here's this problem we should solve. Here's this thing we should avoid in the future. Let's bring that up. Let's look at it. Let's solve it. And unfortunately, most things have just been ways to cope with stuff instead of ways to resolve it. And so, okay, you can talk yourself down. You can, you know, do some mindfulness techniques. You can do some things to like calm yourself somatically, but it's not going to stop the trauma, it's not going to undo it so that you're not re reactive the next time or it doesn't keep coming up in the dark. So um, that is, you know, a big reason that many people have not wanted to, you know, first of all, to do things like meditation and stuff like that, but also wanted to even sit with it or even wanting to go to a therapist and talk about it because you're still left with it and no way to resolve it. And so why would you want to swim around in that thing? And that's actually an issue a lot of people have when they first go to even do this work because their experience has been every time I have allowed myself to think those thoughts and feel those feelings, I've gotten stuck in them it's for days, weeks, or months. It's triggering, right? Yeah. yeah. And so then you think you're going to be stuck in them forever. But the beauty is like most people are out in 20 minutes and like they're no longer, you know, stuck. In I that. will say, yeah, with your Somewhere. audio tracks, yeah. I was so distracted 
by the content, by the narrative, by the multifaceted therapies that were happening concomitantly <laughs> during 12 minutes. You guys, I mean, yeah. I've never, Jill, right? I've never experienced anything like this 12 minutes. I mean, it's like yeah. hard to even explain, but you're you're doing certain instructions while you're getting certain in, like verbal almost affirmations, but you're having to concentrate on the thing. And like, there's so much going on that it keeps your brain so frontally busy that you can't yeah. really go down rabbit holes or perseverate yeah. about the trauma. Um, be, and then by the midway point, it's almost like your brain's so tired of having to focus despite all the different therapies that are happening that you don't have the same feeling of anger or sadness or whatever. I mean, it's just, it really is a fascinating thing. So if any people that are watching are interested in getting these kinds of, of tools uh, and learning more, you know, you can visit April's website, but also if you're an amputee or you know an amputee, you know, we are a funding source for holistic approaches to care. And we very much believe in Orpheus and, and the work that April's doing. And if, if, if funding is ever a restriction, for an amputee to try a modality of therapy like this, which is convenient. You can do it in your own home. It's self-led, so you don't have to it's go- It's available 24 seven. It's it, And it's also pretty, you know, it's reasonably priced and it's like, they have it right in their pocket. I looked for EMDR therapies for the trauma that I, I like I finally got to a place of, of um, action, right? I was like contemplation, pre-contemplation, contemplation, pre like I was bouncing back and forth and I finally moved into action. And so I started Googling and I was like ready and there was like nothing local to me and I don't live in a very rural area. And um, so not only is geographic location a huge barrier, but then the financial piece of that and funding through insurances is a big barrier. So let's and waiting list. And waiting lists, especially right now, post pandemic. Yes. So, um, anyway, go to April's website, apriladams.org. Uh, and if you're an amputee, you would go to lesslegmoreheart.com in the contact section, amputee in need, fill that form out and mention, you know, PTSD, trauma, anxiety, whatever you feel like you're suffering with, uh, and maybe Orpheus or April Adams. And we will absolutely connect you um, and to get some, some aid. Does anybody else here have? Any questions, any comments, any personal testimonies or um, stories that you want to share um, or pick April's brain about? April, can I ask, how did you get into this? What made you want to do this work? Can you talk about that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good question. So um, my big thing was just like, being devastated whenever the honeymoon phase would end in a relationship. And so I just couldn't let it go. And actually it was at the point where I was suicidal about it and could hardly function. So I set out to start to figure out why did I have this need and the other people in my life didn't have this need. And so, you know, I started trying all kinds of different things. Like I was saying, all these different self-help tools and going to therapy and, and all of this. And then I learned uh, Reiki healing. I started doing coaching. I started doing hypnosis. I started, you know, getting certified in all of these different things and starting to take clients and doing those. And it just kept evolving. Like every new thing that I added into what I was doing was not only helping me to overcome a layer of what was going on, but also my clients. And then um, finally, when I got to these tools, I was able to just resolve the issue. And now I'm like completely happy and at peace in my relationship, like whether it feels like the honeymoon phase or not at any given time, um, which is amazing. <laughs> but also then, you know, it just seemed like all along, whatever it was I was learning in order to heal and improve myself was exactly what the next client walking in the door needed. So it's amazing what happens when you start setting out trying to improve yourself in some way that people you can help just kind of start <laughs> coming to you as well. And, you know, I mean, I, I feel like James, I have a similar thing of just like, I just want to get word out about this. Like, since the moment I found these tools, I have been on social media and everywhere else that I am just shouting from the rooftops. I mean, I don't make any money whatsoever yet from promoting these tools, not even from teaching their courses yet. Like, <laughs> it's 
So it, I don't care. It's, it's just, it's so meaningful to me. And I just want people to have access to tools that actually work and actually resolve emotional pain instead of just coping with it. So, you know, I, I feel the same way. It's just like, can we just raise awareness? Can we just have more people knowing that this exists, please? So Thank you. I get it. Thank you, April. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing. Um, really beautiful story. And, and uh, I, I hope we spread this knowledge. That's really amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. I was you. hoping with the remaining minutes um, that anybody who has a maybe it, just quick word, I would love for each person to participate, but I don't want to pressure anybody. April just shared one of the major traumas or triggers emotionally that she had had. Um, you know, and I was hoping that each one of you could either comment on what your trauma seems to manifest as in your life. So like for me, it would be like anxiety or perfectionism or um, speed, like doing too much overbooking to validate myself. Uh, like I could go on forever. I probably have several things that I could go through, but I've done all of those things. <laughs> yeah. Like um, So while I'll just keep talking while you guys are thinking, like how does your trauma manifest in your life? Like what things do you do to sort of mask the way that you feel with your trauma? Because I know for myself, like I've been through phases in my life where I self-medicated. I've been through phases in my life where I isolated. I've been through phases in my life where I was angry. And I've been through phases where I had to prove people that I was the confrontational Karen because like I had to let them know and I, you know, um, and then I've been through the the other side of things where like I was giving to the point of depletion because I was validated in my giving. And um, so I've had so like several morphs of until I did the work and continue to do the work in terms of like the pathologic kinds of ways that I coped and that it sort of leached in my life. But does anybody, can anybody else maybe share for the viewers that are watching, I want them to be able to identify with the several different faces that this sort of presents as. I don't, for me, it's, it's interesting because I don't ever think I felt traumatized. It happened quickly. It was because of my own, you know, my own carelessness. Um, I had diabetes. I let my, you know, I had also had arthritis in my ankle. And it, long story short, it turned into uh, it, it was sore on my foot. And, uh, you know, that healing took a long time. And eventually we, you know, we had to amputate the, the foot. I've been this way most of my life. Um, and I've had a very supportive wife and family. Um, I, <laughs> it almost, at times, it almost feels to me like it's the best thing that could have happened. Because now I walk around. I mean, literally walk around. I'm back driving. I was at the gym today, working with a trainer, trying. So it's not. Any anxiety I have is is more on the personal side than than the physical side than the than the the leg. It, it, that kind of motivates me. It's it's interesting. So I love hearing stories like that, John, and I'm really grateful that you shared. And it's it's um it's beautiful. You know, there's some folks in in our family, our aunt fam, that have had that kind of circumstance, and they and they have an innately sort of positive glasses half full perspective and they also have an incredible support system and that really makes all the difference or may not have previous life traumas that have sort of compounded and, and it's really lovely that that that's the case for you and I'm excited um, that you were able to get to the gym and I'm sure people can identify with with your circumstance I'm glad you're doing well does anybody else have a a different feeling All right, I'm I'm an ex-salesman, so I, I tend to talk a lot. Um, Jill, be, please be patient because Jill has heard me ask this question before. Guys, do you do anything for like a swim leg? Ooh. Hey, hey, John. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I mean, liquid limbs might be interesting. 
Question. We we love that um idea of doing a swim leg. Um, um we right now we're focused on this like shower leg, but I like could go on all day about different beach legs, pool legs, swim legs, things we want to do. Definitely in the near future. We just you know, we James, get I fun. James, I have John's email and I'm gonna have to connect the two of you on an email. That way you can share with him the world of excitement that's coming up. So the answer is yeah. yes, John. There are some options because those two engineers in the blue shirts there are working on ways to help our community. But I don't Always. want to I don't want to be disrespectful of everyone's time and I want to stay huh. within the realm of April's uh, conversation. Yeah, let me let me um answer your question, Tina. Um for the my um I th I want it's very different than like I, I think John's answer. Um so I just um so I didn't really share this, but growing up I had a Lyme disease since I was eight years old. I had like really severe um chronic pain and fatigue like always growing up um but i think the thing for me now um I'm, I'm like healed all better um now but the thing that kind of i still have like this trauma from growing up with that was like i always felt so different than everybody else in school like i actually spent more days in doctor's offices than like actually in school i was always being driven to doctor's offices having blood tests done and taking antibiotics and not being able to kind of have the same life that a lot of people had when I was, you know, in like elementary school, middle school. Um, and I always felt out like outsider. So uh, I think growing up, I always felt that um, I was not like part of the group, like, like no matter what, I would always like bounce around. I'd be in the friends with the hockey kids and friends with the math kids and the you know lacrosse group or whatever but I was never like really in the group like I was just kind of not fit in so I think mm -hmm. now I still feel like like even I've developed a lot more and I'm like I like even like went to you know college and everything and do doing this I always felt like this kind of still is like a feeling or like a fear and I think um something I felt today like I'm part of this community even I'm not an amputee but I feel like I'm part of this you know um like amputee community in a way, like trying to help. Um, so I, I feel like that's the way I'm I'm trying to cope with it. <laughs> now, we'll like, make, but we'll I make you a commemorative that, you know? badge to be a commemorative that, amputee. What do you think? To say, as a card carrying <laughs> member, you've earned your G card. <laughs> you know, they you've do a lot of foresting. Card, you know, I'll vouch for that one. They do a lot of foresting here in New Hampshire, and there's a lot of logging accidents that create amputees. So there's always. Oh, you better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not offering any limbs. <laughs> just, Guys, um... I'm so, so grateful that you showed up tonight. And April, I'm so, so blessed that you continue to come and give your time and your knowledge to this group. And I hope to see more of you back on here. I'm excited to come learn art from you and explore your new hobby. And I'm excited to share your resource and your information with our amputee community further. And we'll make sure to link this on social. Everybody here, everybody watching, if you could help share uh, and disseminate the, the name and the websites. Again, it's just about spreading awareness because oftentimes it's not a lack of people's interest in the thing. It's that the people didn't see that that was a thing. So let's get it out right. there. Let's spread the knowledge yeah. and um, let's continue to do good for everybody by, by promoting improved wellness the ways that we can. So April, thank you. Thank you, April. Thank you so much. Thank I really appreciate you, you. Really lovely meeting all of you. Really yeah. amazing. You too. you too. Have a good night, everybody. And until next time, put your best foot forward. <laughs> you know, it. Good, <laughs> good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.